Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Shula Newman. Today we convene our monthly legal roundtable for a closer look at some of the latest regional and national stories pertaining to the law. There is a lot to talk about. Missouri's new ban on abortions at eight weeks, the legal fallout surrounding former St. Louis County Executive Steve Stenger, challenges in St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner's office, not to mention everything going on at the national level. So let's get going. Join me in studio to get our heads around it all are Mary Fox, St. Louis Chief Public Defender. And Mark Smith, Associate Vice Chancellor of Students at Washington University, and Bill Freivogel, Journalism Professor at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Welcome to you all. Thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, get going. The most recent news of the day is the resignation of Robert Mueller earlier today and his indictment uh, and his announcement that he is ending the Russia investigation. I want to begin by just taking your getting your pulse on what this means as far as what the president may or may not have done. Well, um, I mean, Robert Mueller is sort of an old-fashioned um, public official. You know, he doesn't spend all of his time blabbing. As a matter of fact, this is the first thing he said in the two years. I mean, in some ways it's sort of frustrating um, uh, because you, you, I guess, you know, particularly if you don't like Trump, you sort of want him to come out and, and, and say what you're saying. Um, but be, he, so he spoke for nine minutes this morning. And I think it's important to look at what he said. Uh, and and you know you can sort of hear in the echo in the back of your mind what he's actually refuting of what the president has said. So he said, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Um, you know, this sort of goes to the whole president saying exoneration. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. So we were never going to to charge this president, and it's up to Congress to do something, you know, impeachment, uh, if that if that goes forward. The indictments allege and other activities in our report describe efforts to interfere with our political system. They needed to be investigated and understood, and that is among the reasons the, the Justice Department established our office. So, you know, not it, the, the investigation was properly started, not a, not a witch hunt, not treason, uh, and uh, this was important. Um, and he, he closed by saying thanks to the attorneys, the FBI agents, the analysts, the professional staff who conducted the investigation. These individuals who spent two years with the special counsel's office were of the highest integrity. Uh, and I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments. There were multiple systemic efforts to interfere with our election, and that allegation deserves the attention of every American. That's how he ended his statement. Uh, and I think, he, I think he really thinks it's important for the American people to pay attention to all of the interference by Russia that – uh, the special counsel found in his investigation, and he's clearly refuting the whole thing about this just being uh, angry lawyers and uh, treasonous FBI agents conducting a witch hunt. So where would he go? I don't know. I think it, I think a little bit it adds a little bit of steam to the uh, idea of of having an impeach uh, proceeding with impeachment. Uh, but I think that's uh, still something that the Democrats like Nancy Pelosi want to not rush into. And, and impeachment is, while it is a legal issue, it's probably more of a political issue. And so right. I think they're just doing the, the political calculus of do we do this? Does it hurt us in the election or not doing it? Does it help us? And so, but like I said, that's not a legal issue. It also seemed like what he was saying is, you know, the Department of Justice has said we cannot, we kind of knew from the beginning we could not indict a president, a sitting president. That doesn't mean he couldn't be indicted afterwards. You know, when you look at that report, the 450-page report, it looks like he's kind of laying a, uh, preserving all the evidence in case they would want to do that later. Um, and also, many have said, providing um, a playbook in case Congress would want to do impeachment. Yeah, so there they was said a, leaving it to the House of Representatives, though, and the House of Representatives is investigating the president, or they're trying to. I mean, they've issued a bunch of subpoenas that have been mm-hmm. ignored routinely. Um, wh- how is that even possible, first of all? How is it to possible ignore, to, to ignore, ignore a, subpoena? a subpoena? Yeah, You just don't do what they tell you. And then, uh, <laughs> it's it's very punishment. easy. <laughs> There's um, got to be punishment. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there are possibilities. So uh, Congress can, you can be held in contempt of Congress. And I think, actually, I was looking at this 
question, I guess, during the um, Teapot Dome scandal, somebody was held, was arrested for, not, for failing to comply. That was like 100 years ago, okay. so it hasn't <laughs> happened since. Uh, they could refer it to a judge. I think there are some other options they have um, as well. But most of the time, you know, a judge could impose fines or put you in jail for contempt of a, of a subpoena. For but a con- judge, but Congress. But no, Congress can refer to a judge. Oh, they can refer to yeah. a judge. And, and in, some of the, in some of the initial uh, uh, judicial decisions have said that the, that the Trump administration has to turn over some of these uh, documents. And, you know, of course, the, you know, the big precedent from – uh, from history is uh, is Watergate and having to turn over the the White House tapes. I mean, the, the, as as Mark was saying um, back also from Watergate days, is this Office of Legal Counsel opinion that says the president cannot be indicted and uh, and Mueller was explaining today as he did in his report, but a little bit more clearly, I think that because of that Office of Legal Counsel opinion and because he is a Justice Department employee, he had to follow that opinion. And so from the beginning, they were not going to charge the president uh, with any crime. And that once they have decided not to charge the president with a crime, it's unfair to accuse him of a crime because he would not have a chance in a court setting to defend himself. So so, – Fairness also required that they not specifically accuse him of obstruction of justice. I find Robert Mueller refreshing. I mean, he is an attorney, and he acted as an attorney. He followed yeah. the rules and stuck by the rules. So he is the one person in all of this who has, who has stayed out of the political end and has stuck to his job, which was being an attorney. But now as part of the investigation of the House investigation, they're trying to get his financial records. I'm curious, what is the end game with that? Um, I mean, are they going to try to prove that he has financial interests um, with Russia since there was, um, you know, since Russia did interfere with the elections? Um, what, what's, the, what's the plan there? I know it's political, but. Yeah, I don't know what their plan is, but I would suspect that they think there's some kind of money coming from Russia through the real estate, you know, so rich oligarchs buying property at, at mm-hmm. inflated and they want to they want to catch that. And it seems like, you know, that uh, there's a suggestion that the Trump organization has the, the business organization, not the political organization, has had financial problems and there seem to be these infusions of money. So they're looking for that and trying to embarrass him and probably look for some irregularities so they can, even if they can't indict the president, they can indict his daughter or his son-in-law or his sons or other people involved with the business. The fact that they've got, who's his accountant? Um, I forgot his name. Uh, But he's cooperating, I think, with the Southern District of New York. I mean, this is a huge operation that's been going along for a while. You know, Trump seems to be a guy who sees what he wants to see and and I you know it tells lawyers that this is what I want to do and we're going to do it that's not as a lawyer that's not the kind of client you want you want a client who says who listens to you when you say no we can't do that and so yeah. so and if you can't get if you can't get somebody on anything else what's the best thing to go after yeah. them on income tax fraud right I mean that's the the easy way to go so somewhat related to this, since since we know that Russia has interfered um, in, in the elections, why won't Majority Leader Mitch McConnell bring bipartisan legislation to the floor that could secure our elections? Well, that's a good question. I mean, why, and and I, I, I think that's a good question. I think he's uh, he doesn't want to draw more attention <laughs> to the, you know, the uh, the the unchallengeable finding that Russia did interfere in the election on behalf of. Of Donald Trump and against uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, the president doesn't want him uh, to, to you know proceed on that. I mean, I, I actually think it's sort of a, a, a foolish position for Trump right. to take. I mean, if I were uh, if if I were president, even in his position, I would I would say you know this is this interference in the election, which I didn't know anything about. It's really serious, and we got to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I'm going to, you know, appoint a commission or this and that. Then he's on, you know, the yeah. side of the angels. You know, why? You know, why does he keep? I guess, I guess the answer to, to the question I'm about to pose is he, he feels as though any 
uh, d d any discussion of how he was helped by the Russians in the election sort of delegitimizes his election. And right. He's very uh, doesn't want that to happen. Because Mueller's happen. not even making a suggestion that that was coordinated. The, the, sig the, the biggest suggestion is that they offered up potential dirt on, on Hillary Clinton and that the Trump um, par parties associated with the Trump campaign may have been interested in that. But there's no suggestion that um, that you know, they were saying, hey, you ought to help us destabilize this. But I think you're exactly right. It's it's this idea. I, anything that undercuts the fact that he won, um, he doesn't like. Right. Well, I think what we're going to do now is take a little break. Um, but first, I'd like to invite our listeners into this conversation. If you have a question or a comment about our legal roundtable or for our legal roundtable, give us a call at 314 382 Two five five. That's three eight two. Talk. You can also send us a tweet at STL on air, or you can email us at stlpublicradio.org. We'll be back in a moment. We're going to be talking abortion next. Um, this is St. Louis on the air Saint, uh, on St. Louis Public Radio ninety point seven KWMU. Now let's get back to our conversation with our legal experts, Mary Fox, Mark Smith, and Bill Freivogel. Uh, so now I want to turn the table to what is arguably the biggest story of the week. Um, Missouri lawmakers passed a bill that would ban all abortions at eight weeks with no exception of rape or incest, and Governor Parson signed that bill. Now, Missouri isn't the only state that has taken this kind of move. So the big question I have, I have several actually, are um, will this new law stand the legal tests that will inevitably follow? And Mark's shaking his head yes. Oh, um, well, <laughs> I, I think it depends. That's always the lawyer answer. You never say <laughs> yes or no. Um, depends on what the Supreme Court does. Um, if if they were doing a whole women's health analysis, I doubt it would stay. But um, I that, think that, that's the Texas case. Yeah, the Texas from a case that came years out ago. three years ago, four years. Yeah. And where they said you do this kind of balancing, but you still can't have a, um, a, a obstacle and – uh, this would present obstacles. I mean, there, there's a ban at eight weeks. You can't do anything after eight weeks. That seems like a pretty big obstacle. So, um, but, um, you know, there's, everyone's been talking about this. This is on the national news. And the question is, would the Supreme Court come in and overturn Roe versus Wade? Or would they just really cut it back? Everyone, and this is what I think too, is that they'd probably take the latter course of saying that they're not overturning Roe versus Wade. But substantially limiting it, limiting it uh, you know, saying we're still going to look at this burden, but now we don't find uh, a problem with, you know, we're going to take the state at their word for what they said was the reason they're doing it. We're not going to look into that. And so everything will start getting upheld. So so the Missouri law and all these other uh, you know, laws passed in Alabama, uh, totally banning abortion and other states with uh, uh, with heartbeat requirements are clearly a violation of Roe versus Wade. So if Roe versus Wade uh, remains the law of the land, which it's been for almost half of a century, uh, these laws will be thrown out. Um, uh, it, it, the, 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 it, as Mark says, the Supreme Court could overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, I don't think that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who cares about the uh, legitimacy of the court, would want to do that. It's more likely, but he has indicated an interest in um, in allowing more abortion regulations. Um, and so, uh, as uh, as Nina Totenberg actually said this morning on on uh, on your air, uh, there's the possibility that Roe versus Wade could get hollowed out without being overturned. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, uh, no, no question, but that these laws that have passed violate Supreme Court precedent as it now exists. Barry, you said you had gone through the law, the details of the law, I went right? through the bill, and I was surprised by a couple of things, and one, one of which was I've never seen a bill that says, well, this is our law, but if that's not constitutional, then this is our law. Right, if that's right, not right. constitutional, this is our law. So I'm, I'm curious as to whether that's going to affect the validity of the statute. And the other thing that, that fascinated me was the reference in the bill to the Roper versus Simmons decision which prohibited uh, ch executing children for, in criminal cases. They referred not once, but I think two or three times, to language from the Roper versus Simmons decision 
to to discuss the um, importance of the life of children to the state of Missouri. Hmm. So I thought that was an interesting play. At, but at the same time, this is the same legislature that when they did that, they also refused to pass a bill to give children the right to counsel in juvenile court. <laughs> so, so you know, so we've been talking about the Missouri law, but then in your in your intro in the news, you were talking about the suit against Planned Parenthood. Right. I was going to bring that's, that up. That's not because of the law, though. No, completely it's completely separate. separate. Right. right, right. And I think that's important to know because I think a lot of people, I was talking to somebody this morning and they said, oh, well, this law has already had its effect. The law doesn't go into effect till I think, August or August. something. But this is, has to do with licensing by the State Department of, I guess, Health, Health and Human Services, looking at Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood has filed this lawsuit saying, the, that they need to be enjoined because they are, uh, the regulations that they are, uh, that they promulgated are don't comply with the Missouri Administrative Procedure Act, and that they're they're being arbitrary about enforcing these rules, and that that this is this is just uh, uh, an attempt to shut down the clinic, not to really enforce the rules. Right. That was I was going to ask about this very thing. So you went ahead, you went ahead yeah. and I'm gunning it. for your job. Do they, yeah. <laughs> I came out. Yeah, there were some tea leaves that the Supreme Court laid down as recently as yesterday, uh, in a case from Indiana. Uh, they had a, they had. And a I was going to bring that up too. Oh, you guys boy, are just my job too. <laughs> can I so, can I explain what the court what happened? Because yes, yeah, yeah. I because I found this really really fascinating. Um, so they they declined. There was a case before the Supreme Court from Indiana, um, the law that Governor, then Governor Mike Pence, now Vice President Pence, signed into law. And it was sort of a two-part thing, right? The first part um, indicated that um, Indiana would um, ban all abortions that are sought from parents because they object to either the sex or the perhaps a disability of the of the fetus. Um, the other part of the law um, requires that that Indiana dispose of fetal remains as it would a corpse. And this opens. It's very interesting that they they the Supreme Court said, "Oh, we uphold the part about the remains of the fetus, but uh, no people can't uh, can still have an abortion based on their own selection of sex." So. Yeah, Bill. well, I, I would agree with all of that except for the last statement. I mean, they right. really didn't express an opinion on the part of the law uh, that um, that says you can't have an abortion based on sex, disability, or race. They just said we're not going to review the lower court decision. The lower court had said that part of the law was uh, was unconstitutional, but the Supreme Court did not express a view. Just that they weren't going to talk. They weren't going to think about that yet. Uh, in the first part, in a part of the decision on fetal remains, um, the Supreme Court said, um, even though that part of the law can go into effect, uh, the reason is that nobody ever argued that this violated our, uh, you know, Roe versus Wade, or more actually, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which reaffirmed right. Roe versus Wade. Uh, nobody ever argued that the that that the law about fetal remains placed an undue burden. That's the key that's phrase. That's the Casey decision. Uh, that's the Casey right. decision. Justice Andrew Day O'Connor's formulation of the protection of the right uh, to have an abortion. And nobody ever said that that a law, state law regulating fetal remains was an undue burden on the original. This fundamental abortion. right. Yeah. Nobody ever said that it was an undue burden on the abor the, the abortion, and so it didn't bring into play uh, the uh, our, jur our our jurisprudence on abortion. And no. we are, and it and it said so. We you know we still stand by that. Right. But what it has done, or what one could interpret it is, goes to Mary's point earlier. It does make the fetus be respected in the way that you would respect a human. So it calls into question what is is a fetus a human. Or, you know, fully formed human, and is it uh, allowed to have the rights that a that a human would have? Um, do you? Am I wrong in interpreting? Well, no, that no. Way? I think you're. I think that's a good point to raise. But but I, they did, they didn't express an opinion as to as to that. Uh, one, one really. Inter I mean, the longest. Uh, th there was a long dissent by Justice Thomas, who is clearly ready to go, uh, and it was a it was a, you know twenty some odd page dissent in which he said. 
uh, he basically said that the origins of birth control and abortion are in eugenics. And uh, you know, Margaret Sanger, you know, the the big advocate of birth control, uh, you know, was res- uh, responsible for that connection with eugenics. And it's time for the Supreme Court to, you know, do something about this connection between eugenics and abortion. I don't think it was a dissent, though. I think it was a concurring opinion, but he wanted to make his point. Yeah, but he... Um, he dissented through a concurring opinion. Yes, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> It, it, what, what I was going to say, I think um, non-lawyers don't always get this. You know, the, the scope of review of the Supreme Court over a law is typically what's called rational basis. They say if there's some rational basis for a legislator wanting to do something, they should do it. And and um, it's a very lax standard of review. And, and the idea is, well, you've got this legislature that's democratically elected. Let's let them pick. And they don't have to pick the best solution to a problem. But when you have a law that impacts either a fundamental right, like voting, um, now some would say this guns, Second Amendment, speech, or the equal protection of the laws, then the court says, now we're, we're, we're not going to be so deferential. They do what's called strict scrutiny. And the abortion cases have muddied it a little bit. But under strict scrutiny, it has to be narrowly tailored and there has to be a compelling government interest. So it's much harder to satisfy. And so in this first part of it, they said, hey, you guys didn't even raise this fundamental. You you weren't saying strict scrutiny. So since you guys didn't raise it, we're going to judge it under this more lax standard of rational basis. And we think, yeah, that's good enough. So we'll let it slide. And then the second part where they said, we're not going to touch it. And we were talking about this before the show. They said, well, because there's no split in the circuits, we haven't had two circuits or there, two circuits haven't ruled on it. I didn't even know that was a rule. I thought that was just a a preference or a kind of a unwritten rule. But apparently it's a rule. You have to have at least two circuits. Rule 10. Yeah. So, um, so, <laughs> so it said we're not going to get there yet. So undue burden is, you know, Mark was just explained between this low uh, scrutiny of rational basis and this high scrutiny of, of strict scrutiny. Rash, undue burden is somewhere in the middle. Middle, yeah. Can you can you give me as the non lawyer in the room here? Can you give me an example of when those two have played out, like a case in the past? Well, so when, so this- yeah. So um, there was um, there's this famous case from the '40s, which they, the name I'm forgetting now. What's the one about the wheat? Where some guy grew <laughs> wheat, or is the extent of the Commerce, Clause. Commerce Clause? Yeah, and. Um, and they said, we're going to let Congress do their thing or we're going to let the state legislature do their thing because, I mean, like when I was in law school, you kind of learned if the court says rational basis, they're going to uphold the law. Right. It's just the way it is. And if they say strict scrutiny, they're probably going to strike down the law. Now, what's happened is they've watered down this um, strict scrutiny because the fundamental right for abortion is this this right to privacy, which is not – written directly in the amendments. It comes up from, from the penumbra, which means the shadow, shadow of, yeah, the, um, a few different amendments. And so uh, you've got the conservative justices saying, uh, we ought to be a little more strict about that and not have as many fundamental rights. Getting back to, to Missouri's law, though, which ma- makes this a crime, makes it a Class B felony for someone to commit a, to. Have the, not to have right. the abortion, but to, 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 to perform, perform, abortion, to perform yeah. the abortion. Yeah. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word. Class B felony, 5 to 15 years in the Missouri penitentiary. Um, rape or incest are not exclusions. Right. Medical emergency is an exclusion. Medical emergency is an affirmative defense. So the defendant has to put that into the case and then carry the burden of proof. Are our progressive prosecutors going to prosecute these cases in the St. Louis City and St. Louis County? Uh, that's a good question. I hadn't thought about it. I mean, I think, but I think there's going to be a chilling effect. If I'm a physician, am I going to take that risk that I'm going to find a progressive prosecutor who might dis- decline to? And if to they won't, the will the attorney general step in step and once in, again? Right. It's so politically charged. You you got to believe somebody's going to jump into it. And I, I just got to believe there are so few p- physicians who are doing these procedures already for a variety of reasons. This is just going to make it more, I think, more difficult for them. 
Sure. I, I'll give you an example of the difference between like a middle level of scrutiny and strict scrutiny. Uh, so like uh, burning a draft card to protest the Vietnam War, that was judged under middle scrutiny, which is sort of like undue burden. Mm-hmm. And the Supreme Court said you can punish a person for burning their draft card uh, to protest the Vietnam War. But they applied strict scrutiny to burning the American flag. Uh, and so they said the government has to com- have a compelling – uh, of a compelling reason that the government doesn't. So burning a flag is protected by the First Amendment because they applied strict scrutiny. Burning a draft card is not protected because they applied this middle level of scrutiny. Hmm. Um, I want to take a moment to encourage listeners to join our conversation. If you have a question or comment about any of these topics, especially abortion right now, give us a call, 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can also send us a tweet um, at St. STL on air. You can also email us at stlpublicradio.org. I do want to go back to the Missouri law for a minute and ask sort of a practical question. The law is supposed to go into effect in August. I assume that there will be attempts to block the law. Will that mean that the law won't actually take effect? It depends. Once again, it depends (laughs) on what a judge does. So a judge might enjoin it and say, we think there's a good chance they may prevail, so we're not going to allow it to be Uh, come into law until we decide the case. I mean, I think most likely a lower court judge uh, would stay it, then it would go to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals is probably the most uh, anti-abortion and conservative court of appeals in the country. Uh, I don't know what they would do if they were to let the law go into effect, then there would be another, uh, you know, request for an immediate uh, stay of the law uh, and to the Supreme Court, and almost certainly they would not let it go into effect. Okay. Um, And then finally, related to this, um, we were also talking about Planned Parenthood and the interviews that the Department of Health and Human Services want to do with the doctors. Um, This might seem like a very novice question, but Mary, I'm going to ask you, if these doctors uh, answer the questions now and talk about their process around abortion, does this make them criminally liable months down the road when the law takes effect? No. No. You you would have to commit the action during the time that the law is in effect. So no backwards retroactive. Right. That's a relief. Okay, we are going to take another break. Uh, We'll be back shortly. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. And welcome back. I am talking with legal experts Mary Fox, Mark Smith, and Bill Freivogel. I'm Shula Newman. We're talking about some of the latest regional and national news story pertaining to the law. And we were discussing um, the abortion, Missouri's latest abortion bill, and the also unrelated um, attempts to interview the doctors at Planned Parenthood, which could end up with uh, the the clinic shutting down. Um, We do have somebody who has a call. Um, we want to talk with Ron in Creve Core. I believe he has a question about a heartbeat bill. Uh, yes, I do. Hi. I do. Mm-hmm. I, uh, you hear all the politicians talking about the eight-week uh, uh, abortion ban because of a heartbeat, yet the doctors are saying no fetus at eight weeks even has a heart. So it seems like we have politicians who found a, a great uh, a slogan, uh, devoid of any uh, fact, and they keep repeating it, and no one seems to be paying any attention to the doctors. So uh, I'm just curious what your panel thinks about that. Well, you know, I, I'm no expert on the on the medical uh, end of things, but I, I think we're talking about, you know, signs, uh, early signs of a circulatory system. Which apparently it, does produce a sound that yeah, sounds like a produces heartbeat. A but I also understand this, even this, and once again, none of us, I think, are medical doctors. My understanding is the eight-month me- or eight-week rule starts not from conception but from the last menstrual period. So it could be really six weeks. This is what I've heard doctors That's how they always measure, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, when, when a baby is – Considered conceived is from the last menstrual period. Yeah, yes. so, yeah, but but that, but that was not when I first heard it. I thought, oh well, this must be from conception. They, that they must have some way to measure that, but that's not what they're doing. So so it puts more of a constraint um, 
a much tighter time frame than I think might, people might think otherwise. So many women might not know that they're pregnant. Right. Okay, I want to move to a different topic now. This one not quite as covered as some of the others, but um, public defenders in the state of Missouri have been notoriously overworked. But recently, the ACLU of Missouri and the public defender's office, they have reached a deal that sets a maximum number of cases a public defender can carry. So first, I want to know a little bit more, if you could talk a little bit more about what this agreement is, and Mary, as a public defender, um, can you talk a little bit about the agreement and why it came to be? The ACLU, on behalf of four different folks represented by the public defender system, brought a lawsuit on the ineffective assistance of counsel that they were receiving because of the systematic problems within the public defender system. Um, that, that lawsuit is in the Western District of Missouri and has been ongoing. The court referred it to mediation, and as part of that mediation, a consent agreement has been reached between the public defender and the ACLU on behalf of those four defendants who are plaintiffs in this case. Um, And basically what they are saying is the public defender system cannot continue to represent folks charged with crimes unless they do it right and they do it well, that the state is required to provide um, effective assistance of counsel for someone who is too poor to hire an attorney. And for years they have not done that, and they must now change that, that policy, and they must provide the resources to make certain that everyone who's represented by the public defender is represented correctly. So is there an actual number that they've decided is the right number? So there's, it's not a number. Um, back in 2012, the Missouri Supreme Court issued an opinion saying you need, to, you need to come up with something. And the Missouri public defender system, along with Reuben Brown, went through a Delphi study and came up with case numbers. So for instance, if if I was uh, representing someone on a misdemeanor and representing someone on a capital murder, those co- two cases would not have the same number. So the the number system is dependent upon the amount of time it takes to represent someone in the particular type of case they're charged with. Right, because a capital murder case would obviously take a lot longer. Yes. To, yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, and also, what what is the implication? I mean, can the state afford to to do this. It seems like a very expensive thing. It requires more public defenders, perhaps, or I think also some private attorneys sometimes step in um, to represent people who can't afford it. Or it takes the state of Missouri to decide, do we really need to charge all of these folks with all of these crimes? I mean, the state has control over how many cases it issues. It, just with um, some of the different prosecutors who have come in, Wesley Bell took office in St. Louis County mm-hmm. and said, I am not going to use the county's resources and the state's resources to continue to prosecute child support cases. So the state has an ability to control the cases that need counsel. So that's one way they can step in and make a change. Is that going to take more money? Absolutely. And this is, once again, this is a fundamental right. I mean, so it's not like the state of Missouri gets to say, well, we can't afford this. They they have to afford it. They have mean, to they, find they, a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's ahead of everything else. But they get around affording it uh, year after year, yeah, year yeah. after year. I mean, there's, it's, Missouri is often it has the m- most cases or one of the, m- the highest caseloads for public defenders around the country. Am we I are right? 49 out of 50 on a consistent right. basis. Okay. That's, wow. that's, we don't want to be in second place in that race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. We want to be dead last, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, since you all met in April, there's been some action in St. Louis County. Uh, former County Executive Steve Stenger was indicted and pleaded guilty to basically granting special contracts to his major donors, sort of a paid-to-play thing. Two other people were caught up in the process, one being she Sheila Sweeney, the former head of the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership, and the other is John Rollo, a campaign contributor to Stenger who allegedly benefited from uh, his largesse. So Sweeney has also pleaded guilty, but Rollo has not. And I'm wondering if first we can uh, explain the charges against Stenger, because it is it sounds complicated, and I think they used a very fancy legal term. The honest services fraud? Yes. yes. Honest services fraud. So, so Mark, this is that? something that federal prosecutors use against officials. It is, it is. I wouldn't say it's a controversial docu- uh, doctrine, but it's not, um, not without controversies. And, you know, because you're basically saying you're depriving the, ser- the, the citizens of the honest services you should be uh, providing them. So typically there, there needs to be some overt act. There needs to be some 
pay off. You need to be abusing your official duties. Um, so with, in the Stenger case, when you read that indictment, you know, you see uh, they have quotes from um, – texts and and I think from some conversations even I, I can't I may be wrong about that but it seemed clear to me that they had a very strong record and we talked about I think Hal Goldsmith before he's an excellent prosecutor he knows what he's doing and I wouldn't want to have him on the other side so <laughs> um, so I think you know um, the two individuals pled guilty um, because they thought they mu- their lawyers must have thought this is not something we can win and let's see if we can cut a deal. And I guess sentencing is set for what, August or something? I think this mm-hmm. is Judge Perry, is it? In yes. Federal court. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Rollo, um, I mean, they seem to have him with the same kind of stuff. I'm not sure what his thinking is on for, fighting. For not pleading guilty, you mean? Yeah. I mean... Maybe he's trying to get a better deal. I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, if you read the indictment, the indictment is 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 amazing. Uh, I mean, it's just these back and forth of emails and conversations between uh, Stinger and Rollo. So Stinger, uh, you know, Rollo saying, "Hey, you know, where are we on this contract?" And Stinger, mm-hmm. we're, you know, I'm talking to this or that official about it. We're getting there. And by the way, can. You know, can we backdate your $2,500 contribution for being a trustee uh, so that we can count it in the, a different quarter of the reporting period? And, hey, by the way, you know, when, when can, can, we, uh, you know, can we get another contribution from you on that? Uh, I mean, it's just totally the, – the, 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 the emails and the conversations are just totally entwined between giving – uh, Rollo these contracts for which he is doing no work, uh, and um, a- and giving campaign contributions and um, and and something that it's sort of like the the final blow to me was was you know this hundred thirty thousand um, dollar contract that uh, that Rollo got uh, you know was to make the county's image after Ferguson look better, and and, and he doesn't do it you know there's no effort. Made on behalf of that no at all, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and the contract was for a hundred thousand, and then they said throw in an extra thirty because we got to pay this one guy off. We got to pay another guy off to keep him to keep him happy, yeah. and he, but he's not going to do any work it's, either. The whole thing is just really <laughs> sad, and, and, and you you it, wonder. It's really uh, sick. Well, yeah, but I mean, here's I, a guy. Stenger had uh, a pretty promising career. Why, why would you do this? I don't I don't get that. I mean, and it and it's. It just seems like so kind of obvious what they were doing. Right. And he's a lawyer. He's he should a lawyer. Know he should better. have known, yeah. Well, that's, that's <laughs> What, am I being naive? <laughs> no, I just think it's such <laughs> terrible behavior. I'm sad. I I'm mean, I, I certainly hope it doesn't happen in other, you know, that it just isn't getting caught in other contexts. But the blatant way in which this the, these conversations were occurring of, you know, just mixing up the conversation of political contributions and and contracts for which no work is going to be done. It's just it's just uh, horrifying. Yeah. And what about sentencing, though? Because uh, obviously both Stenger and uh, Sweeney cut a deal, but there still has to be a minimum amount that they could receive. I'm sure they, the the part of the deal. I'm not sure, but I would suspect part of the deal is some recommendations. But I don't think Judge Perry has to. Has to help them. Yeah, she has to. She's not completely bound by what. I mean, most of what I've seen has been, is, uh, you know, uh, prognosticating a couple of years of jail time for Stinger and less than a year of jail time for Sweeney. But but I don't know. I mean, on on their face, I think each of these three counts, uh, honest services, um, uh, mail fraud and bribery has about 20 years. But I, that's not going to happen. Hmm. Well, Maybe it we'll- should. <laughs> we'll so, wait and see. What. So outrageous. <laughs> um, did you, from reading the indictment, did you get any indication that there might be somebody else who could get caught up in this mess? Or is this the end of it? Well, you're, I mean, I'm reading in the Post-Dispatch about the county parks guy. He, um, I, I'm not sure he's caught up with this, but that doesn't look very good. And talk about honest services there. So I wouldn't be surprised. I don't remember seeing other names, although the person who received the $30,000, who's not named, but apparently everyone knows who he is, I think his initials are CM or something, mm-hmm. um, he might uh, be caught up in, I don't know, if he was requesting this money or if it was just a, a freebie. Mm-hmm. 
Well, let's move from uh, one politician under investigation to another. Uh, in the city of St. Louis, St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner um, has also been under an investigation or uh, I'll get into the details about that. Our, our own Beth Hunsdorfer has a two-part series uh, that started off today that looks into Gardner's first two and a half years in office. You can read about that at stlpublicradio.org. Um, um, so, so far, we're still waiting to see what a grand jury is going to do about William Tisseby. And William Tisseby is uh, the special pro- investigator that Gardner hired when she was prosecuting former Governor Eric Reitens. This gets very... Uh, complicated very quickly. Tisby is accused of lying under oath, and Gardner has spent a lot of effort and money to stop the grand jury investigation. She's also asked the city's comptroller to cover more than $200,000 in legal fees. So first off, uh, the big question, they, the, the saying about a grand jury is that a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich, right? Um, so the likelihood, um, what, what do you think the likelihood is that Tisby could also be indicted? He was seen taking notes, I, and I wonder what the charges would even be, because he was seen taking notes, and then he claims that he didn't have any notes, right, and it right. seems like he was just lying. But So it seems like when Ed Dowd went to the police department initially, his allegations were that he committed the crime of perjury. And th- the only hang-up that I see with that is that in, in Missouri, with the crime of perjury, if you resolve the perjury during the course of the proceeding, there is no perjury. So if I take the stand and I lie... But then I am called back to the stand and I say, I lied, here's what the truth is, then I have not committed perjury. In this case, there's the the claims that he initially said, I didn't take notes, the videotape didn't work. But all of that information did come out during the course of of the case. So is there perjury? if that information came out during the course of the case. Now, that's just what I, I know by reading the newspapers, basically. There could be something more. There could be something on the computer servers that were seized or the emails or uh, text messages that we don't know about. But I would wonder whether or not perjury is a crime for which he could be indicted. And we were saying before the show, everyone's under a gag order with right. this case, so it's kind of hard to know what's, what is going on with all of this stuff. I mean, it's, it's 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 an extraordinary case. I mean, where you have this. I mean, here we go with the special counsel again. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, Car- Carmody as the special yeah. counsel, and uh, who and they seized um, her her computers from the circuit attorney's office. Uh, that's pretty extraordinary move. Um, Gardner challenged it, but but didn't not successfully. Um, I mean, she's had, uh, you know, she was elected, uh, Gardner was elected as one of these uh, progressive Former. prosecutors, a reaction to Ferguson, a huge sort of outpouring of political support of young people in the city of St. Louis. I think she's been sort of a, a disappointment, um, and you know, I, wish she had, I wish she had done better. Mm-hmm. It probably was a mistake to, to file the prosecution against the governor not having the picture. But on the other hand, we might still be stuck with the governor if she hadn't filed the prosecution. <laughs> uh, so, is, is she at all at risk of, of uh, indictment herself? I suppose we don't know. She, I, mean, I suppose she, she is, but I don't. But know. they seized her computer. Yeah, is I that think an indication that for, for what? What's the crime? I mean, I guess that's the question. Obstruction of justice. Is there something that she has done? I think we don't know what has happened and, and what that grand jury is investigating. Clearly, they've been investigating for a long time. Mm-hmm. So th- there have probably been a lot of witnesses who have testified in front of them. I think when we find out what they've all been saying, we'll know whether or not there's the possibility of any crime. Crime, And then the other thing would be some kind of legal ethical violation that she could be brought up on. Um, and, and that's a big issue, too, for her. And I'm guessing that there probably has already been an ethical complaint yeah. filed against her, but that is not something that is public. So, right. Uh, so, uh, stick, sticking with Gardner for a little bit longer. Um, what about that two hundred thousand dollars plus that she is asking the city to pay to cover her legal fees, Mary? It's a lot of money. It's but, a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would like to have two hundred thousand dollars for every public defender client. But <laughs> she's entitled to a lawyer. So she she needs a lawyer to represent her. I don't think there's any problem with that. But should the city pay, pay for it? Well, who who is her lawyer? Her lawyer is the city councilor. And who is the city councilor? The person who, on behalf of the police department, went to the court and requested a special counsel. So the city councilor would have a conflict of interest in representing her mm-hmm. and what he has done in terms of requesting the special counsel. So clearly she cannot use the city councilor as her lawyer. So if not... Does the city not have an obligation to provide her with another counsel? 
And she chose a council, though, that costs a lot of money. I guess that makes sense. She wants to do somebody who will do a good job defending her. As do all of our clients. So just (laughs) put that back in there. The governor certainly had an expensive legal team. Yes. He did. And, you know, if, if you get down, if you just look at the whole situation involving the charges against the governor and that whole, uh, how that case played out, and you look at, you know, which which attorneys were doing bad things, I wouldn't put it all on Kim Gardner. Uh, you know, I, I do remember the, the sort of blame the victim kind of interrogation that, were, that, the, that the legal team uh, representing the governor was doing. One and of, the other point that Kim Gardner has made continually throughout this, and I think is a valid point, is that she is an elected official. The citizens of St. Louis elected her and wanted her to be the prosecutor. So what is happening behind the scenes that is to try to remove her as the prosecutor? And and does she not then have a right to counsel to defend her position? Since it feels very political to her. Yes. yes. So another issue related to Gardner, again, is this exclusion list. This is the list that of um, police officers who she will not call to testify because they have allegedly been accused of lying or are under investigation themselves and a couple of other reasons. So uh, first of all, can she do this? Can she have an exclusion list? Sure. She has the right to prosecute whatever she wants to or not. not. And if she believes a witness is not credible, I think she not only has a right to, she has an obligation to not call that person as a witness. I was surprised when the list only had 28 names. I could, I could add a lot more to that of people that I've seen <laughs> testify in court, and I would not find them credible. But when you look at um, what's going on in the federal courts with the number of city police officers who are either facing charges there or who have pled guilty, um, it, it's surprising that it's not lar- bigger than 28. And I think, the, I think the article this morning said that it was up to 36. I think so, too. It might be as many as 36 people that are on her exclusion list. Yes. Yeah, we don't know. And that's out of, what was it, 1,200, 1,800 uh, I think it's about 1,200 no. officers. Yeah, the, yeah, 12, yeah so it's, it's way down now. It's not like she's saying that most police officers are lying. Okay. She's saying that there's this, this small percentage of police officers who are lying. And I agree with Mary that, I mean, she has an obligation not to put a police officer who is uncredible in, before a jury. It would be... It, it, Talk about ethical violation. That, that, that sure is. And I think one of the, the issues that she raised in the interview was, why are these people still employed by the city police department, some of them? Right. I, I that's think that's a, a good question that we need to ask. Why are they still there? It is. Okay, one last topic. We have about a minute and a half to get to, <laughs> and that is Julian Assange. Okay, he's been <laughs> in hiding out in the Ecuadorian principle for some uh, embassy in the UK for several years. And now he's out and the US jumped and indicted him for leaking national security secrets. So um, first of all, Bill, I think you have something to say about this. Uh, You know, is this a problem for journalists everywhere? Yeah, it is. It is a problem. I mean, I wasn't worried about the first indictment, which said, well, he helped Chelsea Manning hack into a computer. I mean, a, a, a journalist, if Julian Assange is a journalist, and there's arguments on both sides of that. A a journalist can't violate a law by hacking into a computer or trespassing or stealing documents. Uh, But what a journalist has always been able to do, uh, and the Supreme Court has upheld this, is if a journalist receives uh, documents that were initially obtained illegally, the journalist has has a First Amendment right to publish those. And, um, I mean, it, the, a, a real good example of uh, a situ- situation is the Pentagon Papers case. Um, so, so what really worried me was when the Justice Department came back then last week and said, Julian Assange, you have violated the Espionage Act. Uh, you're, you're guilty of espionage because he's the first journalist who's ever been charged uh, with violating the Espionage Act. Okay, well, we have to leave it there. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today. Sorry, Mary Fox, St. Louis Chief Public Defender, Mark Smith, Associate Vice Chancellor of Students at Washington University, and Bill Freivogel, uh, Journalism Professor at St. Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thank you all so much for being here. Thanks. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. 
Details at choosewood.com.